All right, so let's bring ourselves up to date on where we are and where we're going over the next several weeks. So we are, first and foremost, it is November 1st, if you've checked your watches. Uh, so time is getting short, but we're exactly where we should be. Um, and so far as context is concerned, um, I keep reading more and more about this pass-through just, just before I came here. There is a long article about, um, part of me can't believe it, but that they're seriously going to try to keep a 25% tax rate for pass-through entities. So this course is going to be, I thought it was important, I always think partnership tax is important up here. It's going to be up there in the stratosphere if um, this 25% tax rate comes to being. So brace yourself, you're going to be you guys master this material in very, very high demand. I kid you not. Um, all right, bearing that in mind, chapter one will need an overhaul because when they start talking about choice of business entities, they're going to say the only go to entity is LLC or partnership, right? Now, obviously, an S corporation is probably going to share the same 25% rate, but as people who are functioning as C corporations who traditionally take compensation and make the tax rate zero, still would behoove them to switch over to being an LLC so, or an S Corp. So just like I said, we're about to, uh, there, there may be a tsunami on the way, guys. All right, um, all right. Chapter two deals with property contributions. You guys can all handle that. Chapter three deals with just general operations of a partnership, um, just odds and end issues. Chapter four is we, we spent quite a bit of time talking about partnership allocations, which we said is so pivotal to the existence of partnerships and what distinguishes them from other entities. I was at a telephone conference this morning dealing with uh, partnership tax issues and special allocations and I have you guys to thank. I'm really on top of the game. They, uh, the people on the other end said, do you, do you know this stuff? Like, and I said, well, I'm teaching it right now. So uh, thanks to you guys. I, I sounded like I knew what I was talking about. Um, there's, uh, aside from special allocations, keep in mind, sometimes you don't have that luxury when it comes to family partnerships and contributed property with built-in gains, right? Code section 704. C, Code Section 704E. So despite all the flexibility I just talked about, um, you got it. You, you do have to be careful. It's not quite as flexible as people sometimes depict. Partnership liabilities. Again, for exam purposes, try to keep it simple. <clears throat> Partnership liabilities, generally, we know you got to Consider if it's recourse, those are found under Regulation 752-2. And we look to see who's holding the bag um, with respect. And, and the issue I was dealing with this morning was there is two partners and they were looking for a third partner to come in. Uh, and the stakes are high here. There's something like a $30 million liability. And they have very, the two partners have very low outside tax bases and they're trying to attract this one-third new partner. And um, you know and I know if they attract the one-third new partner, and that one-third new partner becomes liable on his debt, the two existing partners are gonna be treated as if they shed, right, $5 million worth of liability. And they have close to a zero outside basis. So this might not be pretty for them. So they're trying to remain liable on this debt and have the third party not be liable, the new partner. And on the other hand, the non-tax people are saying, hey, this new person who's coming in, we want them to be joined and severally liable. We're, we're gonna be the three musketeers, not two musketeers. What's this, that only two musketeers have to be liable? So my role was, hey, I completely understand why you would want three people their necks on the line, but that might come at a steep tax price. So you've got to bear that in mind. It's a weighing. 
concept. But you see, people, are, the, the, uh, the principals are saying they want this third party on the, on the line. They want them to have skin in the game. And I'm telling them, okay, just be forewarned that you're going to have possibly a massive tax price to be paid for that. So, um, and, you know, if, if I just looked at this, which you guys maybe at the beginning of the course, you might have just said, gee, I read somewhere on the internet that partnership formation, 721, it's all tax free. See what danger you can get yourself into, right? All right, so partnership liabilities, guys. Um, we have the recourse and then we have the non-recourse. And the non-recourse is found under the regulations under 752-3. And uh, we said it's three tiers, but for our purposes, it's really two tiers. The minimum gain, right, the bill, is there a minimum gain? If, if there is, that, the, um, that, that is not shared by the other partners. And then generally it's in accordance with partnership profits. And we looked at uh, chapter six and we went through and I said, again, that you can't steer too far away from the examples in the regulation. Finally, we went into chapter seven last class, which we're gonna finish today. Chapter seven deals with compensating the service partner. And by the way, this was quite the morning. Why? Because part of the telephone conference, and this is why, I was like, I love teaching. Why? Because again, these issues, if I weren't teaching, I wouldn't be so fresh. The, the, the third party who's coming in that I just told you about, and the dollar amounts here are pretty significant, um, they're talking about the fact that the capital account of this new one-third partner would not, it, it would possibly, let me rephrase this, would equal the capital account of the two existing partners, but they're not the, the new partner. Picture, if you will, that the two existing partners have capital accounts of each 50 million. And the new partner, they're thinking about, would have a capital account of 50 million, but they would only be making a $30 million contribution, book value, 30 million. Everyone take, what, what do you think's going on there with respect to the new partner? Yeah, I mean, that $20 million delta is probably, when you think about it, being paid for some sort of services beyond the property contribution. And all of a sudden, they may have a tax effect, okay? And if you don't mind me pointing out, and I had fun this morning because they said, well, you know, the Sol Diamond case, and by the way, Sol Diamond, unlike the income tax course where there's like 10 cases that Again, I've always said that cocktail parties you can name drop, like Lucas Fierro and Crane and whatnot. There's not too many, kind of sad, right? They, you can't name drop too many partnership tax cases. But the Diamond case is one that you know is fairly well known in the partnership area. So I can name drop and not feel too over the top this morning. And I pointed out that, gee, the other side might have $20 million of income, but since we have a lot of appreciated property, and what's happening is we're taking our partnership and contributing it into a new partnership, and they, in other words, this would really be a new partnership. We might have our own gain recognition, because if you recall in Sol Diamond, when he used a horse, right, to an appreciated horse, that one half of the horse had a basis of 5,000, fair market value of 30,000, that Mr. Diamond himself, not the person providing the services, but the person who um, was the other 50% partner could have a gain recognition, right? Satisfaction of a debt obligation akin to the Keenan case can trigger a gain, right? So, you know, this morning I was pointing out again that the service partner might have some taxable income, but we might um, all of a sudden have taxable income as well. So. Uh, on many different levels, there's a lot of scary things going on on this telephone conference. Um, so again, I have you guys to thank for keeping me on top of the game. Um, so just keep in mind, chapter seven for last week, we, we said that there were three baskets, right? When it comes to um, 
contribution to compensating the service partner. Uh, Evelina, Angie, Doris, you each want to name Evelina, you want to start off maybe? Give us one, one way that we might treat a partner. Just say it loudly, Evelina. In other words, it's a partner who performs services. Uh, how how might you treat that person? To say it loudly, in, in the context, just generally, from 30,000 feet up. Amir, are you going to say something? Go ahead, say something now. What, what? Member, non-member? What? A member, non-member? A member, non-member. Well, if it's a non-member, what code section applies? 70781. 70781, right, Evelina? Right? Then if you function in your capacity as a non-partner, right? Code section 70781 might apply, right? So if you're not doing what normally a partner would do and you know, my example was if you have a real estate partnership and one of the partners happens to be an attorney and they do the legal work, right? And we said generally, are they treated as, um, Diane, are they treated as a, an employer or something else? Diana? Andrew, you're gonna say? It's a third party. Not as an employee, but an independent contractor, right? Yeah. Um, they're the, not going to be an employee, they're going to be an independent contractor. Um, notwithstanding that um, um, Finney decision, but as an outlier. Um, so that's one category. Doris or Angie, what's another category? Go ahead. Angie? I thought it was just not going to be in a play. What, what's the other category? See here? What, what is it, Maria? Guaranteed payment, right? There could be guaranteed payment. What code section is at play? 707. C. right? Guaranteed payment. And let me encourage you, I know there are the old regulations and there's proposed regulations, but um, all kidding aside, Secretary Mnuchin has not had much uh, affection for a lot of recent proposed regulations. So these may, who knows where the proposed regulations are going to go, is my point. Uh, so look at the existing regulations. There's four examples under 707C. They are not several pages long, like the regulations you saw before with respect to allocations. They are probably a half a page long. They are worth reading. They are, again, guys, very hard to veer from those as a professor or as the authors of our book reflect in terms of coming up with problems. So please look at all four of those examples. All right. so. You have 707 payments. You have 707C payments. And last but not least, ping, you have what kind of payments? Distributive share payments, right? All right. So um, people have heard me say this in a lot of different courses. This course is no exception. Three-fourths of the battle on tax is making proper identifications, right? You, if you can identify the category it belongs in, you know the right code section, go from there. Dale? Those distributive share payments. Do those in turn? They're not payments. Okay. Distributive shares? Sorry, those distributive shares. Distributions are something else. Keep going. I mean, I was going to say, do they also lower the partners' capital account? I mean, are they true distributions also, so they go up the income they recognize and then go down for... Well, distributed share plays into what code section 705, that you make money, your outside basis increases, you right. lose money. No, I mean, 
it's a payment to the partner, right? So it doesn't mean distributed share. It does not mean payment. It just means an allocation. Okay. So there's okay. There's not necessarily cash in. Yeah. All right. So we went through that, and um, we looked at you know uh, capital um, capital interests, and we said generally service partners who get capital interests generally are subject to tax, and we looked at a whole bunch of revenue procedures and like, and then we left off uh, our discussion, and we were about to commence the discussion on profits interest. Um, before we continue, um, any questions about the material? Any questions? All right. Um, and I get to say, uh, I was a little disappointed. I did expect today was going to be the day that uh, we were going to hear more details about tax reform. Um, and I keep saying tongue in cheek. You know there's a lot of resistance, right, that Congress, there seems to be not much appetite to eliminate state, state and local tax deductions, right? And there's not much appetite to cap retirement accounts, right? Everybody great? So what, what's there left? Because in theory, we, someone cares about the deficit, so we have to come up with some way to pay for tax reform. So, I secretly am waiting to keep hitting the refresh button on the computer to see if we're going to get a carryover tax basis a debt that Code Section 1014 is going to be significantly narrowed, right? Because what natural constituency says we have to keep Code Section 1014 in place. But again, us tax professors can dream, right? So uh, tomorrow, keep your eyes open. Let's see if my secret proposal get through. Uh, but probably won't. But if it does, shoot me an email, say you read about it. But again, I'm not expecting any emails. I, uh, of, of all the floating things I've heard float, uh, that's not amongst them. But again, there's $300 billion, I argued, in this recent paper. Low-hanging fruit waiting to be picked. But no one seems to be taking up on it. All right. That aside, any uh, movies or anything else this past weekend, guys? Any anyone doing any engagements? Anything like that? <laughs> Nothing. There's a good movie called Happy Death Day. What's it called? Happy, Happy Death Day. Happy Death Day. Yeah, it's kind of like um, Groundhog Day, but like a bad horror movie comedy. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that that as soon as you said Groundhog Day, I was sold. Because it's one of my favorite movies. So, uh, is it in the theaters? Yeah, I think so. Anyone, did you see it? Did anyone see it? I saw it. it you liked it? I enjoyed it, yeah. How did it do on Rotten Tomatoes? Uh, I mean, not good. It's not like a good movie to watch. Like All right. I, <laughs> I, I, I may have to wait on demand. <laughs> All right. All right. So let's pick up where we left off, guys. We've got a lot to cover. Our, our objective, we're going to plow right through Chapter 7. We're going to get through Chapter 8. And I'm going to... I think we're going to get through a portion of chapter 9. So here it goes. All right. So what do we know if someone gets a profit's interest? How did we leave class last time? Jesse, is that something that's likely to be taxed or not taxed if you receive a profit's interest? Oops, mouthful. Yo Yolanda, taxable or not? Um, profit interest? Yes. Tax. You say taxed? I don't think you'd be happy if you got taxed on a profit interest, right? Because it's in the ether, right, Yolanda? You may or may not, if you or your client gets a profit interest, it's not clear that you're actually going to make money, right? So the, in contrast to the receipt of a capital interest, the receipt of a profit interest generally is not taxable, okay? Generally not taxable. However, as the authors delineate on page 254, there are several exceptions. There are several exceptions of when it would be um, uh, taxed, but those are a rarity. By the way, one final push tonight, uh, non sequitur. We're up to about 60 people coming to this brunch, and I just got an email from the speaker who's speaking on effective communication. And I will be in the front row because you guys, um, I'm always trying to learn what's effective communication. 
So aside from the tax, which should be, you know, in and of itself, a great way to spend a Sunday morning, um, we will be graced with this uh, uh, speaker who's from Columbia who speaks about an effective communication. So if you haven't signed up tonight's your last night, consider coming to the brunch on Sunday. And I don't think the weather is promising, meaning what better way to spend a, a cloudy Sunday than uh, with the 60 of us here. All right. So Yolanda, the profit's interest. The general rule, not taxable. Exceptions are spelled out. Three of them on the top of page 254, OK? Um, let's go right to the problems, guys. This is not complicated. For exam purposes, for client purposes, I don't think anyone's going to get tripped up here. OK? Suppose the AB uh, partnership is an accounting firm. Let's make it an accounting firm. C is an associate in the firm, is offered a one-third partnership interest in future profits of the partnership. C is not required to make any capital contributions. Is C taxable upon the admission to the partnership? So would you say, um, in this case, uh, wait, Tan, taxable or not? You think no? No, wouldn't be taxable, right? And we have the uh, authority of revenue procedure 9327, right? All right. And then we have question two. C, an experienced real estate manager receives a not um, forfeitable one tenth profit interest in AB, general partnership whose sole asset is a commercial building with a value of a million in return for his agreement to render management services in his capacity as partner. Net rentals from the building have been averaging $100,000 per year. C has been asked to manage the building in the hope that his expertise will increase the rental income and ultimately lead to profitable sale of the property. What are the tax consequences to C upon the receipt of the interest? So in this case, um, Adrian and uh, Louise, do you guys think taxable or not? <coughs> non-taxable, non-taxable, both of you are on the same page. Okay? And even though it looks like this might be a steady stream of income, um, this is not a, a, a passive rent receipt, right? He's supposed to be managing the property, right? Actively managing, which connotes that there's risk that this may or may not generate that rental income, right? So it's not like a triple net lease. And it's not a guaranteed cash flow. Uh, if it were guaranteed cash flow, then it, it might run amok uh, the first exception in that revenue procedure. But here, uh, because there are actual services that need to be rendered, um, this should be non-taxable, all right? What are the tax consequences to C upon the receipt of the profits interest if C, prior to becoming a partner, rendered services to the partnership in connection with obtaining financing and soliciting tenants for the building. So, go ahead, Amber. I just have a few questions. So the previous one, so you said it's not taxable because it's not a it, It's not necessarily guaranteed. It's, you know, if it's a triple net lease, he would just become a partner and it would just be like an annuity street. But here he actually has to manage the building. So he did okay. All right, so that paints it as being um, non-taxable. Truly a profit's interest. Now, what about in this case, Oceana, Mariana? Uh, Taxable or not, what do you guys say? And if you say it's taxable, why? Just say it loudly, Oceana. The revenue procedures for the high fund gets approved. Well, which, which exception are you pointing to there? Is this a predictable stream? Where do you see the high quality debt securities? Or high, is there a high quality net lease? I don't, there's nothing that suggests that's the case here. Mariana, do you high, disagree? Say again? I would say taxable. Why would you say it's taxable? Um, 
I mean, the thing that's a little bit, Jake, were you going to say something? Well, I don't know if it's 707A1 because I don't know. I'm assuming this is within the scope of his. He ex render service. Okay. He did render services, but most partners, when they're a partner, render services. So I don't know if that could be the metric to gauge whether or not it's taxable, right? I have a question. Uh, does, does it have something to do with the fact that he performed services? Okay, so we'd like to know he did perform services prior to becoming a partner. So, and we'd like to know if he got paid for those services. Certainly, if he got paid, okay, for the services beforehand, and now he gets a profits interest going forward, not taxable. Everyone agree? That, you know, if he got paid $1,000 for his services and then he becomes a profits interest, not taxable, right? If he gets, it's a little bit more problematic if he gets the profits interest. And let's just suppose we know that the service is rendered. Usually, he charges $1,000 for it. So now we know the fair market value of what he uh, contributed. That could be a little bit more problem. Now, my answer generally for these, when it's a profits interest, not taxable unless you fall squarely within the scope of the revenue procedure. So notwithstanding that I have some misgivings here, oh, see, I, I, find it, I don't find it fitting comfortably in any of those three exceptions. So for the moment, I'm going to say non-taxable. Question C, what result in A above if C sells his profits interest for 50000 within one year of acquiring the interest and prior to receiving any profits? Era, do you say it's taxable or not? Ira, did you say it's taxable or not? Was that, a, I'm not sure? No, I don't think so. You don't think so? And um, Brianna, do you agree? Yeah, I agree. Which is not taxable. But when you look at the revenue procedure and the three exceptions, right? What does number two say? Oops. Is it taxable? It's probably taxable in the year of receipt then, right? So you'd have to go back and amend your returns. You'd have to go back and amend your returns and take it into income. And that what? Sets your basis in the interest? Yeah. It becomes messy anyway. Going right. forward, what are you going to do? But theoretically, it's taxable. But you sold it. So it doesn't become that messy. You sell it ten, if you sell it 10 years down the road, hypothetically. But then the exception, it was never taxable. Right, right. Year. So what would your, your base would just be zero? Yeah. Okay. Question D. What result to C in the partnership in A above if C's profits interest was subject to forfeiture until C rendered services for the partnership for a period of five years? Okay? So in this case, Chad, taxable or not? And Dixie, see if you agree with Chad. Okay, Dixie, agree or disagree? Uh, I'm going, you're not sure? Karen? Why? And, and Chad, you said non taxable too, right? And why do you have that position? Well, you had to hold it for five years. Okay, so it's subject to a substantial risk of forfeiture, right? What code section comes into play, Chad, Karen? Say again, I heard. I, I heard you say 83. Who said it? Wave your hand. Oh, okay. Thank you, mighty. All right, 83, right? That's section 83, non taxable. Mighty, what could you do here to ensure that outcome? Do what? Day to five years? I mean, well, you could prophylactically make an 83B election, 
be due to be taxed immediately, presumably the value is zero, no tax. But even if you let after five years, let's suppose you don't forfeit your interest, okay? You have a good five year run, right? You don't forfeit your interest, right? And they'll invest with you, right? Tax or not, Karen? No, no, if, if, if after five years the property interest vests with you, the profits interest, tax or not? Yeah, but then at the current fair market value. Would it? I know what you're thinking because the capital interest, once invested, became taxable at fair market value. But this is a profits interest. And generally, what do we know about a profits interest, taxable or not? Not, it's not taxable. So probably even on its left, wouldn't it be taxable. Why would you make an 83B election at all? Just, we know it's zero on day one, just in case. I'm not saying you would, Kelly. Okay. But I, under, I understand why you asked the question. Because some people get unnerved and they say, just, just in case. Uh, Dale? Does the two-year clock start at the end of five years when it vests, or? I, I would say, Dale, you raised a good question, but I would say it starts day one. But okay. I, I haven't researched that, so that's my instinct. Well, in year five, you will vest and receive, uh, it's going to be taxable. Oh, no, no, year five, he gets the profits interest, it's vested, and every year he gets X percent of the company or the LLC's profits. It's going to be taxable today. Well, any time you actually are allocated profits, it's taxable. But even if that profits interest had fair market value at that time, it's not taxable. Okay? In other words, the IRS has essentially said, you know what, these are impossible to value. Uh, unless you sell within two years, then we really know the value. But otherwise, we're not going to go near this unless, again, one of the other exceptions apply. All right? So oh, guys, in your in your mind, I, I you know I can't expect everyone to remember everything for this course, but you're, you're supposed to take away in your brain a framework of understanding. Generally, when it comes to rendering services as a partner, you get a capital interest. Everyone understand? Generally taxable. If you receive a profits interest, generally not. Um, but of course, be aware there are exceptions. But that's the major takeaway. Now, I can talk to you about the proposed regulations, but they're just that. And even though you might have thought I was saying it tongue-in-cheek, I really wasn't <laughs> saying it tongue-in-cheek. Um, Secretary Mnuchin has withdrawn like six critical, five or six critical regulation pro uh, projects, saying they're way too long um, and this is not serving the business interests. So as a practitioner, I don't, or as a professor, I don't know if it's worth our while talking about proposed regulations uh, at this moment. And uh, it's going to be interesting whether or not we talked last class about carried interest, the 2 and 20. Um, it's going to be interesting to see, uh, given that there is uh, a lot of lobbying going on there, whether or not that's going to stay with us or not. For exam purposes, do not look for any question on carried interest, OK? Um, that even if Congress reforms it or doesn't reform it. If it reforms it, it's too new. If it doesn't reform it, it, it's something that you guys can spend a whole day course on, okay? But I'm not gonna hold you accountable, all right? Ready to move on to chapter eight. Okay. So let's have some fun, guys. This, this is, this is uh, stuff that many of you, material, that in some form or fashion, many of you have seen in your general income tax course or other courses. So um, this is kind of a fun chapter because it's, it's, it's themes that most of you have touched upon previously in, in your tax practice, OK? Um, payments for use of property. Okay, payments for use of property. And the first part of this chapter eight touches upon things we've looked at before and kind of a refresher. So the authors talk about code section 701A, 707C, and distributive shares. Uh, the one thing that they add, you might as well open your code to, is 
code section 707A2. So if you don't mind opening your code. Code section 707A2. Okay. If the following conditions are met, there's three conditions here. It's conjunctive. You've got to meet all three. Not one of the three, not two of the three. Three out of three. A partner performs services for a partnership or transfers property to a partnership. There's a related direct or indirect allocation. And the performance of such services or transfer and the allocation and distribution when viewed together are properly characterized as a transaction occurring between the partnership and a partner acting other than his capacity as a member of the partnership. And this rule, the authors refer to as disguised payments. Congress was concerned that taxpayers were going to use partnerships as a way to circumvent, there's other reasons, but largely to circumvent capitalization, okay? Circumvent the capitalization rules. So it threw in this, because if you can allocate certain things to partners, it's de facto as if you expense certain, certain things that may otherwise have to be capitalized. So um, they want to see if and when you get a payment was there truly entrepreneurial risk associated with that payment? So uh, the factors they look at to see if Code Section 707A2 applies is act, uh, entrepreneurial risk, the transitory nature of the partner, and proximity in time. And these are spelled out on pages 264 and 265. Right? In my opinion, um, unless I'm mistaken, unless you guys are having a very off day, for exam purposes, unless you're not thinking, in other words, unless you just go into hyper gear and you, you look at a question and you're not thinking, it's very, speaking of this, it's very hard for a professor to camouflage these things. It should jump off the page that something strange is going on, that some sort of uh, game is being played by the taxpayer, okay? Because I have to convince you that all three conditions are being met. Met. So hint, hint, you know, an unanticipated um, tax consequences will likely befall the taxpayer. So um, if you are on your game for the exam, I think everyone here should be able to identify that there's some sort of game being played, and there's going to be a tax consequences that the partners did not anticipate. All right, so let's look at this problem. Because that, that's the only thing new here on page 266. We have problem uh, A, cash pay to taxpayers, an equal partner in this four-person partnership, which happens to be an accrual method taxpayer. It has, A has a $10,000 outside basis in her partnership interest. A owns depreciable personal property, fair market value of 15, fair rental value of $1,000 per year. It's a partnership we'll use in its business, right? It's a 1231 asset. Before any of the transactions described below, the partnership has $10,000 in debt income each year. What results in the following alternatives? So normally, Without anything going on, everyone gets $2,500 worth of income, right? Just take a step back. Everyone agree? A leases the property to the partnership for three years. The partners will pay A $1,000 for three years for the use of the property. So what capacity is our partner acting in? as a non-partner, right? Code section 707A1. Everyone agree? So 
Are lease payments deductible, guys? Sure. Authority? Code section 162A3, right? You guys remember from your income tax course, right? The lease payments deductible. Code section 162A3. Now, remember, what year is the taxpayer going to take this in? Whenever he gets paid, he's a cash method taxpayer. But bearing in mind, code section 267, the partnership can only accrue a deduction once the partner takes it into income, right? You recall that, code section 267E. Assuming everything's bona fide, each year, how much income will the partnership have? Yeah. Well, how much? Even? Twelve. What did you say, twelve? One thousand. Well, how much income will the partnership have? 10,000 less, not 11, less than 1,000, right? Or nine. Everybody agree? 10,000 minus $1,000 lease payment. So A will have $1,000 of income, and each of the partners, including A, will have a distributive share of 2,250, right? Because four times 2,250 is how much? 9,000, right? Everyone see that? Because if you don't see A, you're not going to see the rest. Okay. A has $1,000 of ordinary income, a lease payment under code section 707A. And that results in the partnership getting a deduction of 1,000, assuming it's paid in the same year. So that leaves $9,000 of partnership income, 10 minus 1. 9 divided by 4 is what? 2,250. Question B. What results in A above? The rental payments are, are made on January 31st of the year following accrual. So now the actual payment is made the next tax year. That's what you are going to say? What, what, what were you guys, do you recall what I said before about? They can't take a deduction until they take money. They can't, right, Lewis, they can't take a deduction until he takes it in, into income. So year one, there'll still be $10,000, right, of income divided by four. And the deduction will happen in year two, so the same result in A will have the fall of the partnership in year two. So the authors are just trying to illustrate uh, the matching principle. Same result as A, exactly? Except for year two. Year one, it's $2,500 each. Question C. A transfers the property to the partnership, which will use it for three years, and transfer it back to A at the end of that period. The partnership makes a special allocation of its first $1,000 in net income to A. What result to A? So this is your big sketchy sounding scenario. It's a little bit sketchy. Okay. Now, if the income is sufficiently questionable, like we don't, A has no guarantee, right, that the partnership will actually make money, right, then this will be respected, right? Everybody agree that if there's economic risk, right, that does that looks like A is really functioning as a partner, okay? So if there's entrepreneurial risk here, um, then it's just a special allocation akin to chapter four. So um, A would have 32.5 of income and B, C, and D would have 2,250 if there's truly entrepreneurial risk.
and wait, 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 I'm sorry, can you say that again? If there's truly entrepreneurial risk, it's just a special allocation. Um, and it, remember, where's that extra income coming from? Right? There's no extra income. It, in other words, there's ten thousand dollars. The first thousand specially allocated to A. Plus, oh, okay, got it. You got it. Got it. So it's the same as A. So it's the same as A with one caveat. It works out the same way. Let me just point out the difference. When you get a distributive share, what is the what is the cap what <clears throat> what is the character of the income? Whatever, it's determined. Whatever the partnership has, right? So if the partnership has one quarter of capital gains and three quarters um, ordinary income, the special allocation will pick that up. Everyone agree? But in A, since uh, the partner is functioning as a non-partner and he gets $1,000, that's $1,000 of ordinary income. Everyone agree? So there is a difference. A distributive share is a distributive share, and it picks up, you know, it's like a chameleon. It picks up whatever colors are around it. Where 707A payment will be ordinary income in, the, in problem A. Right, but the second part of the problem says, um, what if instead the first $3,000 of the first year's income and no subsequent income in excess of her one quarter share is allocated to A? Now, does something smell in Denmark? Yes. Yeah, it looks like they're trying to fast forward three years worth of expenses into the first year, as opposed to taking it over three years. Are we in agree? So 707A2A probably applies here. Three years of expenses. Three years of expenses. So what would happen here, right, this, this probably meets all three criteria, <clears throat> is that, um, This would be pushed, remember, A is going to receive, right? A is going to receive um, the $3,000 of ordinary income in year one, okay? But um, they're only going to be able to deduct 1000 Let me repeat that. What happens here is A is going to get $3,000 more. Right? And what is the partnership's taxable income? Assuming 707A, um, the 707A2A applies. The taxable income, guys, would be $9,000, right? Because it would be the $10,000 less $1,000 of expense, right? But taxpayer A, in year one, would be taxed on what? $5,250, that's $3,000 of that he was paid, plus one-fourth of the 9000 And taxpayers B, C, and D would be taxed on $2,250. What would happen in years two and three? Each of the taxpayers, A, B, C, D, would each be taxed on $2,250. Right? So for your notes again, year one, A is taxed on 5250 B, C, and D are taxed on 2250 In years two and three, taxpayers A, B, C, D are taxed on 2250 Michelle, your head spinning? Yeah, I just, you write that down, actually. Yeah, you may just say, you can have a board. Well, in year one, a is taxed on 5250 B, C, D, 2250 And years two and three, they each get taxed on 2250 Why? Because in year one, A physically gets 
$3,000, but the partnership can only deduct one of the 3,000, right? And that leaves it with 9,000, that's 10,000 minus 1,000, with 9,000 in tax blind income divided by four, which is the 2,250. In years two and three, there's $9,000 each year of taxable income because we're going to amortize that $3,000 payment, right? That's a, that lease payment of $3,000 is really a payment that should be amortized over three years. Excuse me. Yeah. The extra $2,000 paid to AU1, how will the partnership characterize that? How will the partnership? They can deduct it. So where would they have come out from? If they still recognize any income of 9000 When you say, it was paid three thousand effectively in year one, right? Right. Okay, but the partnership cannot be that. They, they, on their books, they will have this intangible asset of um, prepaid lease payment. Correct. But the two thousand, what would it be? Prepaid rent. Yeah, prepaid lease payment, prepaid rent, whatever you want to call it. That will be taken in year two and three. They'll just carry it on the books. It's prepaid. Okay. All right. Is that something to do with the uh, uh, tax law accounting where you can't accrue for rental expense for more than 12 months? Yeah, there's code section 461H, okay? That you can't, prepaid expenses, you can't deduct unless it's within a 12 month period. So this is an extension of that rule? This is an extension of that. The authors are just trying to illustrate code section 707. A to A here. All right. right. The, the point I would make, and sorry guys for the repetition, you know, just like any time there's related party transactions, your antenna has to go up. Any time your client comes to you with a cutesy idea, I know how brilliant your client thinks he or she is, or you might even come up with this brilliant idea, um, but just think. There's a lot of people who, you know, came before you who came up with brilliant ideas, and Congress may have, just may have, thought of that idea in advance and tried to, you know, close some budget deficits by adding things like Code Section 707A to A, right? So just be careful out there, guys. Very dangerous world. Um, all right. So that's a good segue, or if I might say so myself about the next section, which has a plethora of code sections, ones that largely, or in many cases, you guys should be familiar with, okay? Um, so, this is, in some respects, new, but in some respects, not so new. Um, so, in exchanges with respect to control partnerships, all right? There are two rules here, 707B1, and 707B2. And these make for you know, short multiple choice questions, right? Because um, just make sure that everyone's paying attention on a Wednesday night. Is tonight the World Series? I'll show up. Yeah. What time does it go on? 8.30. Ooh, I hope some people come, I hope some people come back after break. Uh, all right, I had to really make it worth your while. Things don't seem to get interesting until the 13th inning these days, though, right? <laughs> All right, so. But where is it being it's played in LA, right? So they're starting really early to make sure they get the East Coast in, too? That's is, this, it. is this game seven? Game seven. It's game seven, wow. right? Yeah, they usually go by East Coast time. Do they really? Yeah. yeah. Okay. I, I, I think my destiny, I should have been a West Coast guy because um, these games go way past my big time. Some of these games have gone so late. On the other hand, I get up really early in the morning. I could have caught some of the tail ends of some of these games. Um, all right. So we have two new code sections, 707B1 and B2. B1. Sorry to bore you guys. This is old hat. Any transactions between related parties, you guys know how many times here and elsewhere have I spoken about Losses are disallowed. No one's going to fall off their chair, right? You have a transaction with a related party like your partnership, your alter ego. You think Congress is going to allow you a loss? Isn't that self-serving, right? 
right? You have property that is, has an embedded loss, and let's just say you and your spouse have a partnership, and you sell that property to your own partnership? Come on, right? Everyone agree? No one's surprised that Code Section B1 disallows the loss in its entirety, okay? Um, and this is very similar, right, to Code Section 267, right? And um, it does point out, though, it, it, it subsequently, uh, the loss is disallowed, but if you look at the flush language under 707B1, if there is a subsequent sale and exchange, and it is sold at a gain, then you can um, effectively use the loss, if you understand what I'm saying. If it, if it, it subsequently sold at a gain, okay? That it, it evokes code section 267D, which allows you to use essentially the higher basis. Okay, so we're all familiar with Code Section 707B1. Then we move on to Code Section 707B2. Again, rings of familiarity. Where? Uh, code Section 1239, right? If you have a sale or exchange between related parties, right? Eric, you know this. Um, <clears throat> normally, could give rise to capital gain. Congress came back and said, no, no, no. You can't get capital gain. Um, we're going to treat it as ordinary. Same thing, same rule applies in the partnership context. Um, the only difference is, just to share this with you, 1239 says currently if you own more than 50% of the value, okay, more than 50% of the value, here it just talks about uh, more than 50% of an actual interest, okay? so. It's not as fuzzy. Fifty percent of value is a fuzzy term, right, Eric? Where uh, here you would know or not know if you own more than fifty percent interest, right? So it's much more black and white here. Right? So everyone can handle, for exam purposes, 707B1 and B2. And if you don't mind me saying, in weeks to come, once you finish partnership tax, again, you, you got to keep this in your knowledge base, guys. Anytime there's related party transactions, here, here you have it, 707B1 and B2 can come to haunt you. If you don't remember, at least look this up. Okay? All right. Disguise sales. Well, we were just looking at disguise payments. Now, for services, right? We just looked at a problem. Right for services, and now we're looking at disguised sales. Okay, and here, very similar statutory language, but instead of being under 707A2A, it's under capital letter B. Once again, it's conjunctive, right? You got to meet all three conditions. There is a direct or indirect transfer of, prop a transfer of money or other property to a partner or partnership. There's a related direct or indirect transfer of money or other property by the partnership to such partner. And the transfer is described in clauses 1 little i and 2 little i when viewed together are properly characterized as a sale or exchange of property. Okay? Um, so these are treated notwithstanding that it may look like something else it's going to be treated truly as an exchange under Code Section 1001. And the authors go through and they offer several examples. And the main factor to consider is uh, what they call temporal proximity, where you contribute property and within two years, there's a two-year presumption that um, you get back cash or something else that um, it's going to be taxable. Okay? It's going to be treated as a sale. Suppose, however, two things could happen here. 
I mean, if you contribute $100,000 worth of property that you have a basis of $10,000 and you get back $100,000 of cash, okay, that seems pretty straightforward. You've got a $90,000 gain, right? What happens if you contribute $100,000 of cash, excuse me, you contribute that same property and you get back $40,000, right? You don't get back 100. Does that mean you don't have a sale? Because who would ever sell $100,000 worth of property for $40,000? No one here would, right? But, for whatever reason, you might say, gee, I'll sell you 40% of the property. I don't need to sell the entirety. And what would end up happening is, it would be a deemed sale of 40% of the property, and whoever is the contributing partner would be able to use 40% of their basis. So in my example, you would have a Mount Realist of 40,000, basis of 4,000, right? What's 40% of 10,000 is 4,000. So you would have a $36,000 gain recognition. So my point is it does not have to be dollar for dollar. The regulations don't presume every time you contribute property that the only bellwether is if you get complete dollar for dollar of what you contributed. Right? It can be a partial sale. So we're going to see some examples of this, where it's a partial sale, partial contribution. Some of you have seen part gifts, part sales. Well, now we're going to change the motif. It's going to be part sale, excuse me, part sale, part contribution. Also, so again, look for part sales. They can sneak up on you. Secondly, the taxpayer can take out a loan against property, right? Can borrow against the property. In my example, property is worth 100,000, uh, basis of 10,000. Gee, right before I contribute the property, I'll take a loan against the property of 40,000, right? And I'll contribute it to a 50% partner. What's going to be my amount realized? Well, I, I'm going to shed 50% of the liability, right? I took out the liability within two years of the contribution. So something looks a little fishy, right? Looks like I'm trying to cash out a bit, right? And I cashed out insofar as the regulations treat me as if whatever liability I shed is treated as an amount realized. In the example of 50-50 partner, my amount realized would not be 40,000, it would be the amount shed of 20000 And since I'm selling 20% of my $100,000 property, I would use my basis would be 20% of my $10,000 basis or 2000 right? So my gain in that context would be 18000 Now, if your head's spinning, that's OK, just because we're going to go through some, some examples. And you'll see, and I'll, I promise you, I'll write it up on the board, okay? So I have my promise that I'm not going to just be talking. Uh, but uh, all, my only point here is that um, if people make contributions to a partnership and they get back within two years cash or other property, it can be a disguise sale, or alternatively, if they borrow against property and they contribute that property, Likewise, that could be a deemed sale. All right? So that, again, notice, if you don't ask the right questions to your clients, right? Clients aren't going to volunteer that information. So they're going to say, oh, I have this property subject to a liability. I want to contribute it to a partnership. And you're going to say, oh, I know all about section 752. And, you know, generally, you don't have to worry about it. You know, there's but you don't you, you have to say, oh, this could be a deemed sale. Okay? So um, this one can catch you by Excuse me. Uh, Would it be a deemed sale for the amount of the loan though? Not the amount of the loan, the amount you're shed. You understand the difference, right? When you join a partnership, right, you retain part of the loan, right, Benny? Mm -hmm. But part of it you're shedding you're to the other partner. partner. The part you're shedding is the amount realized. How is this different than what we have learned prior of when uh, partner, you know, a new partnership 
Suppose you had a loan against property for 20 years. When you acquired the property, you borrowed to acquire the property. That no one's worried about. It's when you refinance property and then you contribute it. Something smells in Denmark. Good question. Is there a difference between contributing for the formation of the partnership or just Yeah, it's not going to be a problem if it's a formation. When I say, if the, let me stand corrected, it depends on, if you and I go into a partnership and we're forming a partner and immediately beforehand, you have property and you take out a liability and then you contribute, that's a problem, okay? But if you had property that you acquired years ago with borrowed money and you contributed, not a problem. I mean, you still have to be careful of the usual rules but you don't have to worry about a disguised sale. Is it always a disguised sale in that case? Say There's a presumption of two years, and then the regulations, I believe, say, if I recall correctly, that you can overcome it. But good luck to you to overcome it. Right. I mean, because I was just going to say, theoretically, it is possible that something came up to you. And said, okay. It could. I, I believe the I regulations imagine. do give you that out. Okay. <clears throat> Yeah, it's it's two years, it's presumed, um, but I think by clear and convincing evidence, you can prove to the contrary. Okay. Um, there is a new case in this edition of the book, Canal Corp B Commission, okay, on page 272. And without getting into some of the details that are hard to follow, I think the actual opinion, I think, is 20, 30, 40, 50 pages. We're just getting an excerpt. So it's hard to follow some of the dynamics here. Um, but we have a taxpayer that has an interest in W. Taxpayer is an Alcor as an interest in W, and um, GP wants to acquire W, but CC, Canal Corp, has a very low tax basis in W. So if CC sells W, it's going to trigger a significant gain. So instead, they form a partnership, okay, W, forms a partnership and GP, they, together they form a partnership and GP is going to have a 95% interest in the partnership and W is going to have a 5% interest in the partnership and W contributes assets, if you look at footnote one, contributed $775 million of assets, but took out a loan of $755 million right beforehand, okay? Right beforehand. And so even though it contributed assets worth that, it was subject to this liability. So it's only contributing $19.8 million for a 5% interest. In contrast, uh, GP is contributing assets of um, um, 376.4 yeah, million. But what's happening is the loan proceeds, okay, are going back to CC, okay, so um, it's getting all the loan proceeds. I'm oh, sorry? Are they going to CC or They're going to CC. The taxpayer here is getting that money. Okay? And the question is, was this a disguised sale? Okay? That's the issue. 
And, you know, to me, and by the way, it, in this opinion, I, I don't know if the actual opinion, but one of the big four accounting firms, I think, were on this. And I'm just telling you, you're looking for trouble, in my opinion. Like, I, I want to be sleeping at night. If, for book purposes, um, if you look on page 274, the first top paragraph, Chesapeake treated the transit, unlike its treatment for tax purposes, Chesapeake treated the transaction as a sale for financial accounting purposes. Next paragraph, S&P, Moody's, and the stock analysts also treated the transaction as a sale. I mean, there's not enough uh, ambient in the world for me to sleep at night if I were the author of the tax opinion, where I said it's not a sale for tax purposes, okay? Um, that takes some real guts, or whatever you want to call it, to put, put down that it's a non-sale, okay? Uh, what was that? It may have been on Ambien before. It may have been on Ambien before, as they wrote the opinion, okay? Um, because... You know, it has all the aroma, where you have a contribution of assets followed by a quick distribution. Um, and the taxpayer said on page 275 that this was a, an exception to the debt finance rule. Um, okay. Because here it said that the taxpayer W remained liable on, on the debt. And as a result, this was not taxable because um, W um, agreed that it would indemnify GP on any of the liability. So it said that this was, this liability remained vested with W and therefore it, it said it constituted an exception to the debt finance rule. Now, if, first of all, the, the court could rely on, there is an anti-abuse rules that say that, you know, this entity, by the way, W, had no real assets. So and whatever assets it had could have been made to disappear. So when the taxpayer is relying on the, asset, the indemnification of W, it's kind of a hollow gesture. And the court sees right through it, um, and sees that the whole indemnification agreement was merely subterfuge to try to protect this from being a sale, which for GAAP purposes it reported as a sale. Um, you guys can read the opinion for yourself, um, but at the end of the day, the extrapolation here is if you have any sort of transaction and as a result of the debt financing, the taxpayer ends up with the dollar amounts, something is going to be scrutinized. And the thing that really uh, should get people unnerved, and the authors point this out, and I was curious. I hadn't read this opinion yet, so I, was, I, I thought, okay, the taxpayer's going to lose. But the issue that concerned me or made me really uh, think, where is this going, is what did the court do at the end of the opinion? Uh, it, it imposed a negligence penalty. And guess who's going to have to pick up that, that topic? And this is, yeah, the accounting firm who wrote the opinion. All right? So this is not a happy day in the office, uh, of that office. And if you do the numbers, we're talking heavy penalty, guys. The numbers here were astounding. Um, and you could also, depending on what goes on, the IRS also could have, I, I, I don't know, there's a you know tax practitioners who are derelict in their duties. Uh, what penalty could apply? What section 6694 penalty? Okay, so the taxpayer sometimes bears the onus of a penalty, but practitioners who don't have substantial authority—that's the the threshold you're supposed to have, right? Before you write an opinion, if you don't have substantial authority, you can be subject to a penalty under Code Section 6694 as a practitioner. So on many different levels. I'm sure when, when um, the accounting firm got this business, I'm sure they charged lots of money to craft that opinion. 
But whoever the oversight board of the accounting firm, I can't believe they let this one go through. So shame on them. They should all, um, you know, have to look in the mirror. Not just the off, not the, not just the one person on the Ambien. But any any kind of, I mean, this should have gone through several different layers of review at any national accounting firm. All right, but. We're not going to, for exam purposes, you're not going to have to worry about arrows pointing in all different directions. But if something looks weird, it probably is. Right, guys? All right. So let's look at problem one on page 281. You know, I, the, the last thing about transfers of property and related allocations, you're going to see a problem with that. That's not going to come up too often. Okay? All right? So I, I, I know why you raised it. Don't worry. We'll, we'll be okay. All right. Um, <clears throat> partnership is owned 25% each by A, his wife, his wife's father, meaning his father-in-law, an X corporation, which A is a 50% shareholder. What are the tax consequences of the party in each of the following sales? Now, do bear in mind that, um, that some of you who have had corporate tax, this should remind you of what code section? Code section 318. Code section 318. Because that deals with corporate attribution rules. But there's attribution rules throughout the Internal Revenue Code. Attribution rules try to uh, figure out with more definitiveness who owns what. So the fact that one person owns it, you look at their direct ownership, but you also have to look at their indirect ownership. Okay? Um, look at code section um, 707B3. For purposes of paragraph one, or two, one and two of this section, the ownership of the capital or profits interest in a partnership shall be determined in accordance with the rules for constructive ownership in, provided in code section 267C. Okay, so we're, we're going to determine who owns what. We have to use the constructive ownership rules of 267C. You might as well as keep code section 267C out there. And take a minute, tell me what does A own? During the past year, A sells some land in which had a basis of 50, fair market value of 40. Um, so there's a potential $10,000 loss. What is A? What percentage of this partnership is A deemed to own? Come up with, don't, don't say it out loud, and then take one minute, come up with a number. Anthony, what do you guys say?
Do you have a percentage, Tina? Not sure, Anthony? Yes, I think uh, A is needed to own what A is going to own as well, as well as the uh, export. So I think 75% of the losses might be as well. All right, so you say A owns what percent? Uh, he also owns what his wife owns, and since he owns 50% of the export, I think he might be uh, on the hook for 75% of So you say 75%? A owns 25% directly. Everyone agree? Mm -hmm. Does A own what his wife owns? A W. Yes. What's her authority? 267C2 and C4, right? So the spouse, he's deemed to own, right? His wife's share. Everyone see that? 267, C2 and C4. How about the father-in-law, AWF? No. no, right? Son-in-law, father-in-law, eh, they may not get along, right? <laughs> and there's no double attribution, right? You don't go from the father to the wife, to his daughter, to the husband. Okay, that's 267C5. There's no, you don't get double attribution. How about the cork? He owns 50% of what the cork owns. That's 12.5%, right? That's 267C1. That's X. So A is deemed to own 62.5% of partnership, right, Anthony? All right. So regarding loss on this sale, can the partner take the loss? Yes or no? Javier? No, right? What's our authority? What code section? 707B1, right? B1A. That's the basis. Dill, this is your question. It has your name on it. Where, uh, A sell land to an unrelated party, right? No, A sell land to this partnership in which A owns 62.5%. Partnership sells A land. What? And then succeeding year, A sells land to B. I know. Yeah, okay. The partnership, excuse me, is selling it to A. But it's a related party. Right, so the partnership can't take that loss. The, the partnership can't right. take the loss. You asked about A. A's okay, A's apologies. A's. The partnership can't take the loss. Okay. the partner's outside basis. In other words, we have a $10,000 loss that is dis disallowed. Everybody agree? Partnership owned property had an embedded $10,000 loss. Does this, does this loss show up? And the answer is yes, it's disallowed. But if it, remember, code section, I'll give you a code section here, guys. 705A2A. I'll repeat, 705A2A says that you must reduce outside basis like disallowed losses because if you don't, de facto, the loss will ultimately be allowed. So if the loss is disallowed, you really have to still reduce outside basis because if you don't, de facto, the loss would be allowed. And I'll give you more authority, 267, regulation 267B, dash one, B2, example one. Let me repeat, 267B dash one, B2, example one, for the proposition that the outside basis must be reduced. Now when the property is subsequently sold, right, 
So the loss is disallowed. Um, in the succeeding year, A sells the land for 45,000. Anthony, gain or loss there? Look at code section 267D. In this case, um, code section 267D, okay, because 707B1 brings 267D into play, uh, the gain is not recognized to the extent of the prior loss. So the, the gain would not have to be recognized. Would A only get his portion of the gain? Or, I mean, of the loss to offset whatever? No, I mean, I, the entire. Recognize up to 10,000 and would not okay. have to recognize it. Even though he's the one selling the property on his own? Yeah. Okay. Amber? What do you say gain is? If they sell the land for 25 and the basis is 50, that's a loss? No, no, but remember, he bought it for how much? Well, that's his cost basis. So he really has a $5,000 gain, right, Amber? A, in A's hands, he has a $5,000 gain. But that doesn't have to be recognized to the extent to prior losses. Betty, did you have a question? No. Is it recognized by A or by the partnership? A, A owns the property. Okay. How about the partnership? When the sale is made to a non-limited third party? Okay. For the partnership, the loss is disallowed, right? Also, but the asset is sold to an unrelated party, right? Yeah, I mean, if the if the lost property was sold to an unrelated party, then it could get the loss. That's Here, it was being sold to a related party, the loss is disallowed, right? You guys know the old gains must be realized and recognized. Losses must be realized, recognized, and allowed. This loss is disallowed. Outside basis still has to drop. Code section 705A to A. Benny, you got that? Yes. What are you confused by? Okay. Now, A sells, the first part of the question I want to oh, There's two parts. First, the partnership sells the property. Correct. The loss is disallowed. Uh -huh. Now, second transaction. A bought property, code section 1012, A basis is 40,000. Code section 1001, amount realized is 45, basis is 40, gain of 5. Right. Code section 267D says, you don't have to recognize the extent of your prior losses that were disallowed. Which is the 10,000. 10, the 10,000. Okay. Yeah, but the, 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 the entire loss, I believe, is 10,000 here. I don't think A would have to pick up the first 10,000. But the question is, the loss was on the side of the partnership, not A. The initial loss. But the initial loss is the partnership. Correct. Right. So Which is disallowed. So, but when he sells it to B, A himself. Don't say he's selling it to B. He's selling it. Does he sell so it to yeah, 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 so the same? Yeah, the guy person's B. So, the third party, when he sells it to them, why does okay. he get the benefit? Okay, B is some third party. I'm sorry. Go ahead. So, why does he get the benefit of the loss from the partnership? Look at, look at the way Code Section 267D is phrased. Um, it talks about the amount previously disallowed. In my opinion, the amount previously disallowed was $10,000, guys. So that means at that point, the partnership should recognize at least 5000 loss. Why? Well, because... There's, there's, no, there's nothing that says that. That's a good sentence. I mean, sometimes losses di disappear. Don't look for symmetry. I don't think there's any authority for the proposition that the partnership then gets a fund. I, I know there's no authority. So, 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 so,
All right, we don't need to debate this. Um, if you guys find contrary authority, bring it on, and I'll share it with the class. Amen. So if you would have sold it for 51 instead of... Um, you would have had to recognize 1,000. 1,000 feet. That's my position, but if you guys find contrary authority, like I said, I've been, that's my wife, I've been wrong before, okay? <laughs> Why does he get the benefit of 100% of the partnerships as well, also? Because code section 267D is phrased. That way, it says you don't have to recognize the gain up to the amount of the disallowed loss. So he actually gets more benefit then, because if the loss were allowed, he would only get 25%. Loss were allowed. Well, I'm not sure what you mean by that, because then when he sold the property, he'd be selling it at a gain. Right Think about it. Again, I'm challenging you and to prove me wrong, and like I said, add it to my long list. If you find out contrary to ever. If, if you find it, bring it on, okay? What's the problem, Amber? I just want to answer. Amber, the partnership, the loss is disallowed. My authority is 707B, B1, okay? Now, when the partner sells it, okay, my position is that if they, uh, their basis is 40, they sell it for further loss, their basis is 40. If they sell it for 38, they'd have a $2,000 loss. If they sell it for gain, my position is 267D says to the extent of the prior disallowed losses, they don't have to recognize the gain. Okay? So you're saying if, they sold, if A sold to B the property for at a loss, you say they sold it at 30000 then A would get the loss? Sure. Why not? So they won't get the gain up to the Fine. What do you mean the gain? There is no gain. So you can steal Fine, let's stop. If they sell for 30, they're going to get a $10,000 loss. Period. Nothing strange about that. Their cost basis is 40. Okay? What about A's outside basis? A's outside I don't know. We're not told what A's outside basis is. But the, 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 disallowed loss, the disallowed loss reduces A's basis by 5,000. Reduces, the other, well, whatever, it's 25%. It, whatever, each partner would take a pro rata amount of the loss that's disallowed and their basis would go down accordingly. What's my authority? Code section 705A2A. Let's keep going, guys. Um, question B8. Same as A, except that the first sale is to a second partnership, also owned by the same parties, except that the unrelated party, except that an unrelated party owns 25% interest, and X Corporation uh, owns no interest in the second partnership. The second partnership then resells the land to B for 45,000. All right, so essentially, just so you know, if you hear me on this, that the same owners, the same people, own 75% of each of the partnerships, okay? So we have two partnerships here, and there's 75% of common ownership between partnership one and partnership two. And if a partnership sells to another partnership, and there's common ownership between the two, okay? What's gonna happen? We're gonna have code section 707, let me just turn to it because I turned to code section. B1B, code section 707 B1B is gonna come into play and disallow the loss. Again, because you have two related partnerships and you have common ownership, 75% between the two. And we're gonna have, I know you're gonna fall off your seat, the same outcome as in problem A. Okay? This is the author's attempt just to illustrate 707B1B. Question C. A sells depreciable equipment in which he has an adjusted basis of 20000 to the partnership for 30000 
What is A? What percentage? Does A own of the partnership since we're back to 62 and, a half. 62 and a half. So what section applies here? Alicia, what, what section applies if you sell it to related party? Seven. Again? Seven. Say again, Dale? B2A. Seven of what? Oh, sorry, I skipped the 707 part, which is a B2A. 707 B2, okay? 707 B2. The gain is going to be treated as ordinary income, right? So instead of having 1231 gain, right? It would be $10,000 of ordinary income, right? What's my authority? 707B2. Question D. Ace wife sells residential rental property held by her as a capital asset to the partnership for 120. She had a $100,000 basis in the property, okay? So she has a potential $20,000 gain. What's her interest in the partnership, right? Because we need to see if 707B2. So Ace White owns 25%, right? Plus 100. Plus the husband, right? Plus her father, right? And she, she owns one half of the corporation through her husband. Through her husband, she owns, the husband owns 12.5%, and then there can be double attribution from the husband to her. That's permitted. So it's 87.5%. And uh, my authority for the double attribution, um, you know, for her owning the stock interest is um, 267C1. 267C1. So, Annetta, what says ordinary income? Yes. Absolutely. She owns, she's like, she's selling it to herself in the mirror. Pretty close. So what percentage has to be, to be ordinary? You tell me. 50 or more? More than 50. Not 50 or more, more than 50. Okay. What's my authority? You see it right there. I'm not making it up. I want to make a difference in question A. Same as D, except the partnership is in the real estate business um, and it's rental property. It's in the rental, rental um, it's in the real estate sales business. It's still one in there. And the only thing the authors would make the point is, in this case, Code Section 1239 would not ordinarily apply because it's not depreciable in her hands. Code Section 707B2 doesn't care if it's depreciable in her hands or not. Um, it's it, 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 um, a purchasing entity. Um, in, in other words, the partnership, even though it's going to hold it as inventory and it's not depreciable in its hands, Code section 707B2 still applies. So it's still 20,000 of ordinary income. Let's do one more question and then we'll take a break, guys. Let's do question two and then we'll take a break. Uh, partnership, CD is owned 50% by C um, and 50% by D. Okay, everyone have the visual? If C sells an asset to CD, amen, this has your name on it. Um, uh, it recognizes $1,000 loss on the sale. Would the loss be disallowed? Yes or no, Amen? Uh, yes. Yes, what? It disallowed. Why would you say disallowed? Is it piece of the teacher? Is it a related body? You tell me. 
It's 50%. Doesn't apply. The loss would be allowed, right? Everyone agree? It must be more than 50%. It must be, for the, for the loss limitation to play, it must be more than 50%. Here it's exactly 50%. The loss limitation rule would not come into being. Right? What difference would it make if C's father, okay, F, sells an asset to CD and recognizes a thousand dollar loss? So picture F, your father, your partner with someone to your left or right in this class, and your father sells you an asset to the partnership in which you're a 50 50 partner that has a loss. Can your dad get the loss? Now we know if your dad sold it to you, the loss would be disallowed. Everyone agree? What's my authority? Code section 267. Right? But suppose your father, or 707B1, suppose your father sells it to the partnership. Well, the, the regulations the author cited to, 267B, as 1B has a little bit of a surprising answer here. It says that 50% of the loss would be allowed, 50% disallowed. So it looks through and says it's the equivalent of your dad selling it 50% to an unrelated party and 50% to a related party. So the answer is somewhat surprising. Amber, for your notes, $500 loss disallowed. All right? Diana? Um, is 50% just because of the way the, the interest is allocated, or is it always? No, I mean, what I would say is if dad sold it to a four person partnership, the way they regulate, I would say 25% of the loss would be disallowed. Okay? So anything allocated to the related party or something? Anything allocated to the related party disallowed. Get a drink, use the restrooms, come back. We got a lot more to cover, guys. <laughs> All right? All right, you guys ready? Question three. All right? A, is it cash method? 25% partner in this four person partnership, which is an accrual method. As a $30,000, this time, Amber, we know the outside basis, right? 30,000 outside basis in our partnership interest. A owns depreciable equipment, okay, that's a 1231 asset, just basis of 1,000, fair market value of 20. Before any of the following transactions, the partnership has $60,000 in net income each year. What are the tax consequences in the, in the following alternatives? A sells the equipment to the partnership for $20,000. Now, I think all of us here, right, know the answer to this question, right? Jenny, you know the answer, right? Jenny? Sorry? I'm, I'm saying, not, not Benny, Jen, it's Jen. Jenny, Jen. Jenny. Jen. 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 So what do you say the answer is? If any sells the equipment to the partnership for 20,000, Not a trick question. Gain or loss, Jen? I'm sorry? Is there a gain or loss, Jen? Gain of how much? Code section 1001. What's the amount realized? 20. What's the basis? 1. 19,000, right? No question mark, right, Jen? 19,000, period, okay? That's easy, right? Everyone have that? I'm sorry? 19,000, right? It's just under 707A1. There's no related party. So 25% over. What basis does the partnership have in the property? Cost basis, right? 20,000, right? Code section 1012. 
707B does not apply. Agreed? Yes, sir. All right. Question B. A contributes the equipment to the partnership, 721. A has not allocated any additional income, but her capital account is increased by the value of the contributed property. God bless, right? Of course. Later in the year, A receives a distribution of 20,000. Lisa, something smells in Denmark? normally it's 721 not taxable distributions are normally not taxable so what's your answer taxable or not you're whispering no. oh, that was the, that's your shout <laughs> you say not taxed I think it's taxed. Okay. you say it's taxable why what code section I don't know. Andrew This is within the two-year frame, right? Yeah. So code section 707A2B, A2B. Right? So this would likely be treated as the same result as an A because temporal proximity, this is done within one year. There's a two-year window period. This is under regulation 707-3C1. I'll repeat, 707-3C1 would yield taxable income. Yep. If it happened in the second year, you go back and we treat it as if the yeah. sale occurred at the time of the transfer? I would. Okay. As opposed to, you know, you're right. Okay. These taxes will be the distribution, right? Fine. Amen. These taxes will be the distribution. Well, this treat is a disguised sale. And in this case, still, I, I'm not sure. The sale actually happened in year this two. Is, yeah. Right. Because, it, well, in this case, not. It's whenever the money is distributed, it's when, in my opinion, the sale is completed. Right? This is cash by the taxpayer. So it's when the sale is completed in this case. Okay. okay. What, if, what if the other partners get the same distribution? Does it matter? Like if it's an even distribution to all partners? Well, again, you can overcome it by presumptions, right? If, you, if there's clear and convincing evidence. So I understand your point, and if everyone gets the same distribution, that may say it's not a disguised sale. Okay. okay. Yeah, it's like annual distribution. Absolutely. Uh, Absolutely. For, for B, the yeah, taxable is 20 point, It's 19, because his basis is one, right? He gets 20, it's deemed sale of, you know, the amount realized here is 20, the basis is one. It, it's truly treated as a disguised sale, nothing more, nothing less. Suppose the distribution instead was 15,000. Eric, were you whispering something? Yeah, part sale, part contribution. Part sale, part contribution. What was the part sale? 15,000 was this, the amount realized. 25%. Not the 75% sale. 75% sale, 25% contribution. So, this is under regulation 707-3F, example one. 707-3F, example one. So, we're deemed to have sold, right, 75% of the equipment, right? What's the gain? 
15,000 minus how much? 750. 750, which is 75% of the basis, right? So the reportable gain is 14,250. Everyone agree? And what's that's the sale, right? What's the contribution? Five thousand dollars worth of equipment with what basis? Two hundred and fifty dollar basis, right? So what basis will the partnership have ultimately in the asset? Fifteen thousand two hundred and fifty, right? Cost basis of fifteen thousand, right? Are ready, great? And under 723, the contributed property will be a carryover basis of $250, right? That's one fourth, right? By the way, um, it, it's one, in other words, there's $20,000 of property, three fourths is being sold, one fourth is being contributed, one fourth of 20,000 is 5,000. If anyone couldn't tell, Ashley's a little cold, if you couldn't tell by the hat. Okay. I don't know, actually, if you sit further down, you can, I'm, I'm getting heated up here. <laughs> but I'm, I'm not feeling your, your cold. I want to fall asleep. I got to stay in the tundra here. Okay, stay in the tundra. All right, everyone got that? As Eric pointed out, part sale, part contribution. Sale 75% of the asset. 25% contribution. The 75% is treated like a regular sale. And I see Angie, you too are wearing the hat, okay. Um, oh, you guys forgot to tell me, anyone dress up here for Halloween? <laughs> no one? I chickened out. What were you gonna be, Tamara? I told you, cotton candy. Oh yeah, cotton candy, yeah, what happened? It was too sexy. Too sexy? Oh, okay. <laughs> Oh, I've seen that costume. <laughs> next year. Next year, next year. Remember, every year it gets harder to wear the costume. All right. All right. Everyone got that? So, sorry. It's not minus 250. You're contributing property worth 5,000 5, with a basis of 250. That's not, that's just a contribution. Okay? Say it loudly, what's the question, guys? I, I can't hear you. I hear what's the basis in your month. The basis of the In the hands of the partnership, yes. it's going to be the $15,000 cost basis, right? It paid $15,000 plus $250. That's the carryover basis under Code Section 723. Okay? Question D, same as B, if I accept that one month before the contribution, A borrows 15,000 on a recourse basis, securing a loan with equipment, uh, securing a loan with the equipment. Connection with A's contribution, the partnership assumes the $15,000 loan. Later in the year, A receives a distribution of $5,000. Partnership and its recourse, each one's going to be 25 percent responsible. So, anyone feeling brave out there? Now you're feeling brave. Want to go for it? So, is the loan problematic? Yes, it was taken out within two years of the contribution, right? There's regulation 707-5A7, I'll repeat, 707-5A7, that, that whatever you shed is gonna be treated as 
uh, amount realized. Okay? So what's A's amount realized here? 11,250. 11,250. Where does this number come from? 75% of 15K. Okay, three fourths times how much? 15,000, right? That's how much liability the taxpayer is shedding, right? So that's the amount realized. And just so we know, 11,250 over 20,000, right? Because this is the total fair market value is 20,000, right? And A is deemed to have sold. 11,250, right? Which is what percent, guys? 56.25%. Right? Again, A is deemed to have sold property worth 11,250, which is 56.25% of the overall value of the property. Lisa, you got that? So, what is A's basis in the entire property, we were told? 1,000. 1,000. So A is deemed to sell 56.25%. You know, so that we multiply that percent times 1,000. That's the basis. So uh, under code section 1001, what's A's gain? 10,687.50, right? Now, A is also receives a $5,000 distribution, right? Is that considered a deemed sale? Sure, it's within two years, right? So A's amount realized is 5,000 on the sale, deemed sale. What's A's basis? We use 5,025, or 20. 25% of the $1,000 basis, 4,750. What's that number? What is that number? It's deemed to have sold 25% of the property, right? Because he got $5,000, right? $5,000, and he has 25% of his basis is 250. So that would be his gain? This would be his gain. So what is the 10,687 considered what? Yeah. The what? It's also 10,687. This is gain, this is gain, right? So this is gain at the inception? The other one of the sale. Right. Now, A is also deemed to have contributed property, right? What, what is the 562 The 562.50 is his basis in this property. Where did I get it? That's the percentage of property it was deemed to sold. We took this 56.25 times the thousand dollar original basis, right? The second gain is there's a liability of five thousand dollars on the property, right? That, right, and that's deemed sale. That's oh, distribution, okay. guys. Oh, the second, the second. Oh, I'm sorry. It's distribution. I apologize. Oh, okay. Distribution of five thousand. Okay. Now, just to close the loop here, he's deemed to have sold. Right, if you do the arithmetic. Sixteen thousand two hundred fifty a property, and he's used up. Um, if we do the arithmetic here, uh, let me. Yeah, there's not and a half left. Okay, hold on one second for my. I'm, I'm working a little bit slower here. My <coughs> caffeine isn't kicking in as much as I would like. Um, Eleven, eight, twelve, right? So um, that means, right, 
that he's going to be making what's left here to the partnership. There's he's going to be making a property contribution of three thousand seven hundred and fifty dollars with a basis of one hundred and eighty-seven dollars and fifty cents. I'm putting this is not. This is a contribution, like we learned in the second chapter. This property he sold, this property is deemed to have sold, this property is deemed to have contributed. If you do this plus this plus this, it's going to equal $20,000, right? If you do this plus this plus this, it's going to equal $1,000. Dale? Do you essentially lock in that $20,000 of fair market value? time that contribution say in year two he gets another distribution I would say you lock it in you lock it in so even if the fair market that's value my understanding okay. all the examples seem to lock it in okay I mean it seems like it would be disastrous if you didn't but I was just curious. yeah otherwise you can't get the symmetry that mm -hmm. this would produce Which, which don't, so this is the kind, in other words, yeah. the partnership ends up with $20,000 worth of property, right? Everyone agree? Yeah. Okay, in, in this problem that, um, we're going back to B, um, is that it ends up with $20,000 worth of property. A is deemed to have gauged in de facto two, two sales. One sale, for this proportion of the property, one sale for this proportion, well, the other remaining portion, right, the partnership got 20,000, this must be a capital contribution under 721. Why is it only C um, contributing? We also have I didn't say C, this is just for C contribution. Oh, okay, I thought it was the point. No, no, okay. that's just okay. the word, letter C to denote contribution. Okay? And what is the authors trying to do? The authors are just trying to illustrate, you know, the, the uh, debt financing, a distribution, and then, you know, the element of just a plain vanilla contribution all wrapped up in one problem. If this were to happen over multiple years, then... Well, remember, you can't open open too many because the presumption only applies in the first two years, right, right. Andrew? Yeah, right. Say in the second year. I'm just thinking it through that you're going to have, initially, you're going to have the contribution of 20000 and, and 1000 basis, right? And then... Oh, it gets messy for depreciation purposes and all. No, no, not depreciation, but, but just... Then the second year, you're going to have this as your. Yeah, I, what's your so, question? Though? I mean, I guess so. You're going to adjust the base. I mean, the, the, you have the, to adjust the basis. basis adjustments would would give you the same answer anyway, right? I don't know. I could say yes, but I'm not sure if we're talking the same language. Uh, in other words, we're just looking at the effects to A, who has to recognize these two things, and then. The partnership has to adjust its basis in the property accordingly because instead of having a carryover basis, it has a cost basis. Okay, because it's a team sale. So, so that, that, that means that the partnership basis is 16 for. I'm going to tell you the partnership, I didn't do it, but it's this plus this plus this is the well, partnership basis. The, the 11, the 5, and the 187? It's this. Ten thousand six hundred eighty-seven fifty plus four thousand seven hundred fifty plus one hundred and eighty-seven dollars and fifty cents. Why would it be that? Why not? I thought it was the cost basis. Wait, what do you mean cost, the cost basis? Cost is eleven thousand two fifty and five thousand. That's. Oh, I apologize. You're, you're right. Uh, okay, I, I need to have another sip of caffeine. Mm -hmm. uh, no, you're you're absolutely right. You had a little too much caffeine. Uh, maybe I did have too much caffeine. <laughs> Um, you're absolutely right. Everyone, for your notes, I see it corrected. Uh, absolutely right. Uh, the partnership bought this. This is the cost basis. It paid eleven thousand two fifty. It paid five thousand. But this, I am right. Yes. It's one eighty seven fifty. Okay. We're good. And for my edification, what is that total? It's sixteen thousand two hundred. Four thirty seven point five. 
How much? 16,437.5. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay. Okay. What's on the side then? The 16,250 to 18,250. What? All the way to the right. You just told them across. I just totally need it across just so that we can back into these. Oh, numbers. okay, okay. Okay. So the three the three thousand seven fifty should be one thousand seven fifty. Huh? What are you talking about? Here? The three thousand seven fifty should be three thousand seven fifty. Yeah. Okay. Equal to one thousand seven fifty. You got to add up this plus this plus this has to equal twenty thousand, man. Okay. Okay. Question E. A contributes the equipment to the partnership for. Um, contributes the equipment to the partnership. Okay, so far so good. The, part, the equipment is reflected on the books of the partnership and it's a thousand dollars adjusted basis. And it, A's capital account is increased by a thousand. Whoa, something's wrong here, right guys? Yeah. Who's gonna make that kind of capital contribution and only have their capital account going? Not me. Don't put me in that pile, right? Mm -hmm. Right, Michelle? And that puzzle along. And you should. It doesn't make sense, right? You're a partner. Your capital account is your your you know your your main artery. I mean that's your life life blood to have a robust capital account, right? Something is awry here, right? Let's keep reading. In order to ensure that A is compensated for the full value of the equipment. The partnership allocates and distributes the first $19,000 of its income to A. The remaining $41,000 of partnership income is split equally by all four partners so that A is allocated a total of $29,250 and the remaining partners $10,250. Now, this is beginning on page 280. This is the, the reference that I sort of skipped where it says transfers of property and related allocations. What is really going on here? The partnership is playing a game, right? They're trying to get a deduction instead of having to capitalize the value of this property. They're trying to get it, the partners are trying to get a de facto deduction, right? Okay, and they're camouflaging it through the use of the capital account. They're misrepresented. So first of all, I don't want to be the accountant or attorney on this because this is somewhat tax fraud, right? So don't have my name to this <coughs> of, uh, tax planners. But putting that issue aside, this is code section 707A2A, okay? A2A, this is a disguised payment for property or services. We really should be back to the same results as in problem A. And when you have these um, secretive uh, capital account arrangements, they're really disguised sales. So your answer for E should be that this is a disguised payment, disguised sale, back to problem A. Problem F, suppose you have, uh, the partnership does not need A's equipment, but A nevertheless transfers it to the partnership. B transfers similar depreciable property um, to the partnership. Two months later, uh, the partnership distributes A's old property to B and B's old property for two thousand dollars a day. Okay, something you know again is fishy going on here, right? And we're going to look more at this in about two weeks or a week. This is called a mixing bowl transaction. The authors, again, uh, well, and that's how it's referred to in practice, a mixing bowl. We throw it in the partnership, you mix it up, and you spread it out. Uh, but this would be a disguise sale between A and B. Okay? Disguise sale between A and B. Code section 707A2B would likely apply. Each one, A would have to probably recognize 19,000, and B would probably have to recognize 14,000. All right. All right. So the message here, guys, for exam purposes, Dale. 
they recognize in 19 because it gets the, the, it gets the additional $2,000 distribution? Yeah. Okay. Because it was just property, it would just be the 18, right? Yeah. Okay. It would be a part sale. Um, your takeaway here is to no code section 707A, the disguise sale rules coupled with 707B1 and B2, right? Loss disallowance and character of income. They're very mechanical. Uh, EMAN, you gotta look at more than 50%, right? Um, everyone here can handle it. Make sure, I erased it, but the attribution rules, right? It's not plain vanilla, you know, just who, you know, the direct ownership, but it's indirect ownership, right? So for exam purposes, do not forget, under code section 707B3, it includes indirect ownership. Now, we are going to have some fun. Why should this be any exception? We're going to have some more fun, I should say. Uh, chapter 9. Sales and exchanges of partnership interest. There is no surprise how this chapter is uh, divvied up. We are first going to look at the consequences to the selling partner and then to the buyer. Okay? So bear in mind that this chapter is going to, just in terms of you thinking about this chapter, um, it is divided into two parts, and it's very important that you apply the right code sections if I'm asking you the consequences to the buyer, or if I'm asking you the tax consequences to the seller. On one hand, damn it, you wish it were easy. What do I mean by easy? You know, someone says they're selling a partnership interest and you say, gee, I sat in on tax 101, I know code section 1221, and I look and I vaguely recall that I know that a partnership interest is not inventory, it's not a 1231 asset, it's not an account receivable, and I know that code section 1221 says the whole world is comprised of capital assets, except as enumerated. So your temptation is to treat how? Capital ad, treat partnership interest as what? Capital, right? Capital in nature, everyone agree? Temptation works, right? And we know, Kelly, people love capital assets, right? Right? As they get older, forget about the teddy bear, right? You used to take the bag, people want to take their capital assets, right? All right. So, um, that's what the world's about, or at least in the United States, right? Um, so, the what was that, Dale? Okay. Well, you can, you know, got to equal or whatever. Um, all right. So, that's what you would think, and we could almost be done tonight if I were to say, people sell their their partnership interests, capital gain. Let's close our books and go home. But that ain't the world, okay? It starts off simply enough. Code section 741 says treat a sale or exchange of a partnership interest as if it were a capital asset, right? That's promising. But so be it. It says, except as otherwise provided in code section 751. So 751 is going to rule or at least it's going to take precedent over 741. And you may recall, I hope you do, from your income tax days, Eric, do you remember what case says you have to, you don't sell a business with a capital P, you sell the individual assets? You remember that famous case? Williams v. McGowan. Williams v. McGowan is an old chestnut case. I thought you might have used it last night at Halloween, but apparently not. <coughs> All right, Williams v. McGowan. Remember that you gotta, you know, if you sell a business, you gotta look individually at each asset and classify groups of assets. Not surprisingly, 741 
says treat as capital acceptance provided as 751. What are 751 assets, guys, generally? 751 assets are? Inventory and receivables. Inventory and receivables are considered or will give rise to ordinary income. Seven forty one and seven fifty one. You can't forget seven fifty one. Client's going to call you and ask you, "Oh, I, I thought I'm going to get capital gain." You've got to warn them at seven fifty one. And again, uh, or maybe not again. Um, inventory is going to include twelve forty five recapture income. Okay, so just be forewarned, twelve forty five recapture income is going to. You can't rid yourself of that taint. So, the authors also point out that you're going to have to figure out when a partner sells and asks, sells their interest, what is their outside basis, right? And remember, if they sell it partway through the year, you have to adjust their outside basis, right, by their allocable share of income. I repeat that if you sell during the year, you have to adjust their basis by their allocable share of income. And partners used to play games no more with tiered partnership arrangements. They used to try to bury their 751 assets by putting it in a lower tier entity, cut section 751F does away with that. So that if you have lower tier entities, those lower tiers are essentially pierced upwards so that the higher tier entities that you might be selling will capture the 751 asset. So 751F puts the brakes on people playing games. We have a generic case. This is not one, Eric, you can use at Halloween. No, not too many people are going to know the Glazer case. It's not got the recognition of the Diamond case for Williams v. McGowan. Um, here, taxpayers sold a partnership interest, and the partnership had subdivisions in it, okay? And essentially held inventory. And the taxpayer was trying, not surprisingly, to get capital gain treatment. What's the court rule here? And it said, you know, guess what? When the partnership is essentially comprised of inventory, any gain is going to give rise to what kind of income? 751 ordinary income. 751 ordinary income. I can never pronounce these cases. 291, how would you guys pronounce that before I embarrass myself? Anyone gonna help me out here? Lodeau? Okay. So, um, 291. I don't know. Anthony, you have a chance to read this case? It's you. No? Anyway, Benny, Louise, you get a chance. Adrian, say again. The do. The do. The do. 
Okay, did you read the case, Luis? I <laughs> do. I, I mean, again, I, I, I read the name. You read the name. Um, Andre, did you get there? Carrie? Anyone, any volunteers? Eric, you have a chance to read this? What happens here? Uh, so, John, whatever his last name is, uh, sold his interest in a dog race track, uh, but the caveat was that he had, um, how am I what was the amount? He was getting paid like $160,000 a year in uh, exchange for him running the track. Uh, so when the sale was made, they were trying to determine how much of the sale was associated with those purchasing receivables, or not what they call receivables, what are they called? I mean, receivables. Unrealized receivables. Right, unrealized receivables. In other words, um, <coughs> here's a taxpayer selling a partnership interest, making a significant amount of money. Taxpayer would like on the sale to treat it as capital gain. The arrows comes back and says, no, 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 not a capital gain. This is 751 gain, sound familiar? Um, and the IRS, if you look at footnote two, okay, does its computation here and says, uh, looks at the fixed assets and looks at whatnot and takes the value of the difference between the total purchase price and the fixed assets and essentially says the rest is attributable to um, a, a receivables, right, Eric? Essentially. Um, and the court does what here? Uh, like the conclusion you're talking about? Right. Yeah, well, what? How they ruled that if the, that difference was receivables because that's how he calculated how much to be paid anyway. I mean, he, he calibrated how much he should be paid for his partnership in large part based on what this partnership was going to make as a result of his, of his services. And you might argue, I think, in retrospect, this was poorly done on his behalf because he was probably paid in part for goodwill. Um, part of his partnership probably, um, there's a portion that was goodwill. And I can't understand for the life of me, just, just poor legal advice, someone's getting sued here. Um, if you look on page 298, the partnership agreement specifically says, no part of the purchase price is allocable to goodwill. All right, well, taxpayer essentially, you know, if I were the practitioner here, whether it's the accountant or the attorney, this is when you, I don't know if you really want to fall on the sword here, because the practitioner got up in front of the court and said, essentially said, I am an idiot. I didn't know what I was doing, and I just threw in that clause, essentially. All right? I don't know if I would have done that. Um, because the court essentially says, well, you're an idiot, but we can't revisit this, and the taxpayer loses. The taxpayer has perfect MO now to sue you for malpractice because you essentially fell on the sword. So, I, I don't know. Um, your, your takeaway from this case, again, when um, you have a claim, you're selling a partnership interest, uh, you really have to look hard, scrutinize, and figure out the portion which might be attributable to 751 ordinary income. Now, in my notes, and I recommend this, I'll leave it up to you, but um, this is like a dance move, okay? I don't know how else to equate it. It's a three-step dance move. Now, uh, uh, maybe, Luis, do you, do, you have, do you speak French? Okay, I'm gonna blow this, so let me, let me, there's, is it pas de toi is what? The word, <laughs> isn't there a phrase, pas de toi, doesn't that mean a two-step? No? I'm, okay, so I'm completely mispronouncing, I'm, send me, if I remember, I'll send you an email tomorrow. I, I, I'm 99% sure it, it, there's a phraseology in French that means a two-step. But 
I have to check uh, with my sources. Anyway, in French, there must be a word for a three-step. You, you're looking at me. Yes? Say, say loudly and slowly. How do you spell? T-R-O? Yes. And that means a three-step? Yes. What? No. 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 Okay. Fine. Go slowly for me. T-R-O. T-R-O. I-S. S. Pa. Is it three? Three. Twice three. Okay, but... Uh, okay. Let me get away from French because we're not going to... I'm not going to win. All right. Um, it's, it's, it's a... It's a French term usually referring to a dance and ballet between three people. It's called what? Pas de trois. Pas de trois. Is it, how many people? Well, you can spell it. This says P-A-S. P-A-S. But I don't think that's correct. Space, D-E, then trois. And trois is how? But I always, I always thought it was P-A-U-X. Okay, but it's... And then trois. Pas de trois. T-R-O-I-S. And it's a three set. It's a dance between three people. Oh, it's a dance between three people. Yes. Yes. All right. All right, guys, the message I'm sending here <laughs> is, you know, a little French, a little tax, right? What could be better, Louise, right? All right. Is that this is going to take three steps to get right, okay? Everyone ready to do a three step with me? All right. So here's the three steps. Let's look at problem one. Beginning on page two, 299, for exam purposes, I think this will serve you well. Partner A owns a one-third interest in ABC Cash Method Calendar Tax Partnership, which manufactures and sells inventory. A, B, and C, the original partners, each make initial contribution of 75000 All income has been distributed as earned. On January 1st, remember, it's the first of the year, right? So we don't need to allocate any outside basis as a part year. A sells his interest in the partnership to D. Okay? Uh, consider the tax consequence of the sale to A, assuming he has uh, owned his partnership interest for several years. The balance sheet of the ABC partnership is as follows. So, ideally, A likes to sell it for 135. What's his basis? 75, gain or loss here? Gain of how much? 60. 60, right? And like to report it as a capital gain, right? Kenny, no. Why? Because code section 751. So here's the three step. Here's the three step. Okay, everyone ready? Do a little dance together. Step one. Compute the gain. Determine the gain. Okay, that's the step one. How much is the gain here? 60. 60, which is what? 135 minus 65. 75. Everyone have got that? Minus 75. 75, okay? Sorry, oops. Minus 75, I meant. So the gain here is? 60. Step two, so that's step one. Okay, step two is to figure out, because it takes priority, the 751 gate. So step two is to figure out the 751 gate, right? Take a look, we have a one third partner do we have any 751 assets in the balance sheet? Yes. Yes. We have two. We have the inventory and the accounts receivables. What's A's pro rata share? How much? One third. One third. One third and equals how much? 80,000 for the inventory. What's A's proportionate share, guys? It's not a trick question. Inventory, what's the embedded gain? 15,000 divided by 3. Plus goes how much? Five. 5. Accounts receivable, 45 divided by 3. Is how much? 15. 5 plus 15 is how much? 
20,000. Step three is the 741 gate, which must be here how much? The balance, or 40,000, right? We know we have 60,000, everyone agree? We, have a, we know 20,000 must be ordinary. By default, the 741 gain is 40, agreed? Question B. Anyone not get this? If you don't get this, you, it's not worth going on. Go ahead. Do you do about this step too? Oh, hold on. Let me just get checked. So 40 is cap. 40 is cap. Amen. Can we go about this step too? We can do whatever you want. So step two, we know the receivable is 45 divided by 3. And then the, there is an inventory. 90,000. Right. But so the basis is 75. Right? So the gain is 15 divided by 3. Okay? Question B. I have one more question. Okay? I was writing down so how do we get 40 percent three? Because we know it has to equal 60. Oh, okay. That's our overall gain. Question B. Each partner originally contributed 150. And each has an outside basis in 150, and the capital asset has a basis to the partnership of 330. A sells his interest to D for 135,000. So each one has an outside basis of 150, and the capital asset, for our purposes, instead of having a basis of 105, has a basis of 330. Everyone ready to do the three step with me again? Even though it's late, everyone can do the dance move. David, you ready to do the dance move? All right, let's do it. Hey, how did you get that? What was that? 135. The amount realized is 135, right? And then 150K. Alright, everyone agree. Step one, we figure out the overall loss is 15,000, right? Everyone agree? You don't get that right. Step two and step three ain't gonna be pretty. What was that, Ashley? If you take off your hat, you'll, you'll get it better. <laughs> what? what was it, Ashley? What's the number? Well, the number is the amount realized 135 basis is 150. Okay, loss last I checked is 15. <coughs> David, you ready to do step two? David, was that a yes or no? Mighty, you there? Tina? Step two, anyone want to go with me on step two? Hey? Okay. So we use the same balance sheet? Same balance sheet. Bing? Bing, bing. Step two? No one wants to hold my hand on this one? You're whispering. Same as A? Absolutely, same as A. Right? It's still got that same 20,000 of embedded ordinary income, right? Everyone agree? So that $15,000 loss is that kind of ordinary. Oh, Ashley, are you going to step three with me? I just feel like this sounds not good for that. <laughs> I didn't say it was good or bad. What is step three? Is the 741 gain or loss? And Ashley, you say it's what? A loss. A loss of how much? 35,000. 35,000. Capital loss. Damn it. Code section 1211 is going to limit that capital loss, right? 
Capital loss limitation rules, right, Ashley? It's not a pretty day in Mudville. Oh, yes, you do. We know we got to get to negative 15. We have a $20,000 gain. That means we got to get, and that makes sense because. What, what, what? Capital loss. Wow. Wow. <laughs> but wait, that makes sense, though, guys. Look at the capital asset. It's got a basis of 330, fair market value of 220. Our pro rata share is minus 35, right? Right? You can back that. In, you can back into that number, right? Penny, you got that? Amber, Jesse, Yolanda, you got that? You see that? Seriously. I didn't get the step three. Yolanda, let me ask you a question. There's a capital asset. What is, it, what is the basis for problem B? 150. Say it loudly. 150. What's the basis? It's 330 in question B. They tell us to assume it's 330, right? Yes, Yolanda? What's the fair market value? 225, right? If that capital asset is sold, what's the overall loss in that? 105. How many partners are there? Divided 105 by 3. What does it equal? Ta da! You got that, Yolanda? I mean, Yolanda, that's a way to check yourself, but it also should work the other way. Our overall loss is 15, our gain is 20. We know we have to get back, right? We feel like um, Dorothy in The Wizard of Oz. We've got to get back to negative 15, right? So we know we've got to fill it in with negative 35, but you can check yourself. I missed that song in the movie. All right, I know. It was a bad metaphor, but what can I do? I don't have red shoes on tonight, guys. Sorry. <laughs> Go ahead, email. For step one, can we say the basis is three theory divided? No, no, you cannot say that. Because step one looks at the taxpayer individually. It looks on the right side of the balance sheet, not the left side. Right? In this problem, in problem B, we look at the taxpayers. Uh, this is what David did. You look at the taxpayer, not, not, not the capital asset. Right? In the basis, PT. That's the that's in the capital asset, and that was to help Yolanda figure out the capital loss for 741 purposes. And had nothing to do with step one. Step one, we look at the taxpayer, him or herself, what they realize, what their outside basis is. But if they wouldn't give you the 330, you still figure out the, the loss, the 35. Right? You need that information. You need that information, man. You can't do that for this problem without them. I mean, guys, you're gonna have to look at this, okay? Truth be told, you're gonna you may focus on this over the weekend. If you have questions on Wednesday, we'll address it. But don't get mad at me. No one's gonna get mad at me. On the exam, you're gonna see something similar to this because if and when people talk about selling partnership interests, is that something that happens once in a lifetime in a practice? No, that happens regularly. And you need to be able to compute gains and losses. Again, the first half of the chapter is to the seller. Then we're going to look to the buyer. But this is not something you should get mad if I ask this question, because everyone should say, oh, during the exam, I can do this three-step uh, pas de trois, or whatever it is, or whatever the French is, or not the French is. Kelly, you had a question. Well, the numbers always work out. The numbers should always work out. I mean, there may be, and I would have to tell you that. And I can't say there's always a goodwill. Sometimes businesses don't have goodwill. Okay? Ashley. <laughs> Not enough. I, I mean, truly, if you guys want, this is nothing you should. I mean, I usually try to get into bed by 10, but I always, my alarm goes off at 4.30 sharp. And I usually get up at 5, 4.25 because I want to catch the 4, 4.30 news 
to go down to the treadmill. So I, even though my alarm set is 4.30, I, knew it. I always, I knew it. always <laughs> start instead. Karen. I thought you said part of it was you to be allowed, though. This is it, Karen. Other questions? Now, let me just get you first for problem C. Okay? Well, we got to do a little bit more. Go ahead, go ahead. So this is all that's for the partner, the seller? Yeah, this is the effect to the seller. No, everything that you see is here. Let's just look at question C. Um, suppose you only contributed 45,000 cash instead of 75, and the capital asset was purchased and held subject to a $90,000 liability. A sells his interest to D for $105,000 of cash. And what is the author's point here? What are the authors trying to illustrate here? They're not shedding the liability. What is the amount realized here? If someone buys A's interest, D, um, D buys A's interest for 105,000 of cash, what is A's amount realized, guys? Say again, Alicia? It includes the liability. How do I know that? How do you know that? Crane. Crane. So what's the amount realized? 135. 135. Everyone agree? So what's the answer here, guys? It's the same as A. The amount realized here is 165, 135. The basis is 75. Oh, the basis is going to include 75. It's going to include the liability. Right? Crane teaches us that too. So if your notes, the answer here, you can think about it. Same as A. Now, guys, um, let me just give you a little foreshadowing of what's to come. Um, we will look at... Um, the, look at be, beginning on page 307. The whole focus changes. What are the tax consequences to the buying partner? Okay? And there's going to be an exciting moment in this class. Why? Lots of exciting moments, but in particular, code section 754. You may have heard that term of art before. 754, you're going to get your first look. So it's going to be very exciting. And not a lot of reading. We're only going to go up to page 332. There's not a lot of reading for next class. Um, so have a great weekend, and make sure you catch up on whatever you missed tonight, OK? So I'll see everyone on Wednesday, and some of you at the brunch. Have a good night.